missed, you didn't record yourself. You missed your you missed recording yourself very very sly that eh? thanks um yeah i'm really nice to be able to give a talk i'm sad i'm not coming to cambridge uh because it's always nice to visit cambridge uh but hopefully soon um so yeah um learning to calibrate models so i am going to talk about uh so machine learning in the physical world how can we use machine learning to help us calibrate models and and sort of in engineering applied math uh, science in general, um, it's always a central question that if we want to use models, they have parameters and often we are unsure what to pick as those parameters and often for toy problems, that's not too hard. We can use optimization, we can use Bayesian inverse methods, but when you go out in the real world, um, this can be actually a really challenging problem. Um, and yeah, so I'm going to talk about um, related to my research. Uh, and some applications that I work in, uh, focusing on one in particular, which is kind of easy to understand, uh, about how um, we exploit machine learning uh, to, to help us calibrate models. Um, so I don't know your background. I asked over. So maybe this might be too easy for you. Maybe it might be too hard. But I would just ask you to ask questions or, or if you kind of think, oh, yeah, I know that, ask, ask me something push me a bit more okay uh so um and interrupt me all the way through right so it's not a it's not a lecture it's me talking about some stuff when and you can ask lots of questions okay so first of all oh you're going to see two slides at once hang on it's not there. Let me do it in Okay, perfect. Okay, should be able to. Okay, so first application that I work in is uh, groundwater surveys. So um, often uh, you want to know how water moves through our subsoil, and um, and that could be for sort of flood remediation. It could be for all sorts of sort of uh, town planning. Understand how uh, water moves through uh, the ground beneath us, um, and often this is quite a challenging problem because we're uncertain on, on actually what the rocks are made of. Uh, and um, the measurements that we can take are either constrained, like we can't dig holes everywhere and look to see what the rocks are. So we can only take sort of sparse measurements of what the rock might look like underneath our feet. Um, and so sort of a, a classic problem in uncertainty quantification or calibration is about, can we calibrate what the field, the, 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 the permeability or conductivity field of the rock, hydraulic conductivity of the rock is underneath our feet uh, based on sparse measurements of, of wells in a location. So what you're seeing here is um, a project that I work on, which is uh, an adaptive finite element model uh, where fluid is being pumped into the middle. Uh, and then we're ob observing how it, 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 it uh, diffuses through the rock or flows through the rock. Um, and, you know, this is a very challenging problem because the rock can sort of change permeability over a very small length scale. So you need a very fine resolution model uh, and there's lots of uncertainty. And, and as I said, taking uh, lots of measurements is, is challenging because it's extremely expensive to, to dig holes. So a uh, sort of an open question is, how do I use a model to in, sort of uh, make predictions about how this system behaves? based on these sparse measurements and a very large uncertain input space, i.e. what does the rock permeability do? We'll go back to this problem because this will be the benchmark that we talk about but in a simpler setting. Crystal plasticity. So there should be a picture of a bridge here as well. So I work on a project called the MX3D Bridge Project, which is a, a 3D printed bridge project, uh, uh, which uh, spans a river in Amsterdam. And it's made of a metal. So at a micro scale, a metal is, uh, is crystalline. Uh, so this is a, a representation of a computational model of a, a sort of random realization of a crystalline structure. Um, and so one of the open questions is, well, uh, so each of the, so the grain size comes from a distribution and each of the colors represent a different orientation of crystals within that grain. 
And um, so based on, on experiments of small blocks of material, you might like to understand or calibrate what that uh, orientation distribution is. And by doing so, it would allow you to embed it into larger structural models of, of say, for example, the MX3D bridge and ask the questions, is this design safe? Uh, you know, what's the likelihood of failure? What's the maximum load it could take? Uh, so uh, yeah, material science application, um, large dimensional in input space. So uncertain input space to your model and then uh, you know, limited data on the outside. So this is sort of a reoccurring theme. A final example of an application which you might think about where you calibrate models is uh, at Turing, I lead um, a program with NATS, which is the National Air Traffic Service. Uh, and they, um, they basically control all flights over our heads uh, in, in the UK airspace. And uh, you, to be able to make predictions or to be able to control this airspace, you'd like to be able to make predictions ahead of time about what a plane would do in particular weather situations. And so there are physics-based models called BADA, which uh, describe the flight mechanics under different conditions. And uh, the, the question that they set is, they've never been sure what to take as their parameters. So they, they have a, a guess um, based on their, their, their physical understanding, but what they really want to do and what we've been doing with them is, is calibrating these models based on flight data. So you can build sort of uh, probabilistic trajectory models which are well calibrated on data so all i would say is these examples where needing to calibrate models turn up in engineering uh, all over the place and, and more so particularly in models when you're making high stakes decisions so covid for example something that i've worked on what should you take as your parameters in your covid based models really challenging question um, but fundamental to being able to make decisions uh, what I'm interested in is not only making, picking one set of parameters for your model, but the distribution of uh, possible parameter sets. So, i.e. accepting that mod models are wrong, uh, they come with some level of uncertainty, the, the, the data that you measure is uncertain, and also the models you know, aren't, aren't perfectly replicate the true uh, behavior of that system. So what is the distribution of possible parameters? Uh, which could explain my system. And by that, I, I sort of bake into it this uncertainty in, in the predictability uh, of a model. So just to put a bit more maths on it, formalization, uh, we're going to, so we're interested in calibration of a Bayesian inverse problem, we call this. So basically we have noisy observations of a system, D. So in this example, top right, it was, it was, uh, measurements of the pressure head of water at sparsely located points. Uh, this is some weather simulation I do with University of Bath, uh, someone called Eichen Müller, uh, which is about simulations on a, on a sphere. So this is a sort of pressure distribution on a sphere, which you could have, imagine having Met Office data for, uh, cardiac data. So you, you, you would have maybe snapshots of measurements of flow through the heart, for example. Or the classic example down here at the moment is this is about COVID cases in Germany, which I've been working on with Heidelberg. Uh, so these these would, the data here would be sort of infection rates at, at, which sort of binned within location. So essentially, we've got this vector which is full of data uh, and often sparse relative to the the sort of underlying uncertainties in the system. And then we assume we have a mathematical model. So it could be a family of models, but we, let's assume we've got one for now which is essentially a mapping between, so we call this the forward map. So it takes a set of inputs theta and, and then you know, it applies the model. So it could be finite element, it could be a set of ODEs, it could be some deep learning model. And then it spits out uh, a prediction of your data. Uh, so this is a mapping from parameters to model predictions of data. And this allows us to, to make a direct connection. So these, these essentially spit out vectors of the same size. So we can say that, okay, the difference between our data and our model is, is described as epsilon. Um, I guess you use epsilon hoping that it's fairly small and you've got a good model, but essentially we then assume that this has some distribution and, and you can choose different distributions for this, but in, in this case, we're just gonna assume that the discrepancy between model and, uh, and data is, is a Gaussian with zero mean and some covariance uncertainty, right? 
So what we really want is uh, we want the distribution of parameters uh, given our observations. So we we can define something called a prior, which I'm sure you've come up with, uh, come across in this course. So a prior distribution is the distribution of the parameters prior to observing data. So it's what I might expect. It could be just sort of simple visible brown. So in an engineering application like material science, Young's modulus could be greater than zero. So you just make sure that they're in physical bounds. Or if you've got a smart engineer that you know, and they have a good idea on, on, on well, the parameters somewhere between this value and that, you can bake that into the prior. And then what we seek is updating that essentially to, to also then include that we've now made some observations of the real system, noisy observations of the real system. And so we note this as the distribution of parameters, the distribution of theta, given some, some observation. And just as a point, often in, in, in these applications, we're interested in uh, not just the parameters that um, uh, sort of are calibrated in the model, we're also interested in the statistics as some output, given that we've observed data. So I've, I've called that Q for quantity of interest. So this could be the full solution itself. It could be in um, it could be an infection rate at a certain location at a future point, or in this example for the fluid flow, it could be sort of the average flux over a boundary. Anything you know, any quantity of interest that you're interested in, you then might want to compute some statistics. So we say this is the expectation under the posterior distribution, so the distribution of parameters given the data of this quantity, and this this would give us sort of estimates of the quantity of interest given that we've observed some data. So I don't know in the course um, whether you, you've come across methods for, so, okay, what we really want is we, we want samples from, from this distribution. We want samples from the distribution theta given D. Um, and one way of doing that is, I mean, there's our Markov chain Monte Carlo methods and Within that, a subset of methods, which I'm going to talk about today, are kind of the simplest in terms of understanding the vanilla methods are metropolis hasting methods. And you, you've probably heard of them. So um, forgive me if you, you all know about them, but it's always interesting to hear someone else say it in a different way, I guess. So, um, so metropolis hasting methods basically generate what we call a Markov chain. So this is a sequence of... Uh, uh, vectors of the, the input parameters, so from 1 to n, and the algorithm is designed in such a way that it converges to your target distribution. So in our case, this target distribution is going to be the uh, distribution of theta given d, right? Um, and from Bayes' theorem, uh, you can basically say, well, actually, well, so sampling from this, unless it's a really simple problem, is is not possible directly right and so what we do is we apply Bayes so essentially this is the probability of theta given d is proportional to the probability of observing the data given a fixed set of parameters so we call this the likelihood so how likely is the data given you've you've set the parameters given a set of parameters and then uh, times by the prior so just the probability of observing uh, probability of, of those parameters in your with your prior knowledge. There's, it's, there's a proportionality uh, relationship because there's a normalizing constant, which assumes that this integrates over the whole of theta to zero. But in metropolis hasting methods, we don't need to worry about that. And I'll show you why later. So as I said, ooh, so as I said, uh, pi of d given theta is the likelihood. So probability of observing the model given uh, the modeling parameters and if we go back to to this expression um in this case the this defines the likelihood right so um this it, it, the likelihood is gaussian so we can actually write down uh that the the likelihood in this case the one we're going to study and it's pretty standard is is exactly this multivariant gaussian right with this covariance uh, i told you what the prior is before okay so the key ingredients to a metropolis hasting algorithm is, like I said, okay, it defines a Markov chain, right? Well, that's that's fine, but is is the key ingredients is how you make the transition. So how do you how do you walk around in this Markov chain? And and to do that, we define or, uh, the user defines or picks a transition kernel or a proposal distribution, 
So this simply determines how random moves along the chain are going to be made. So we say Q uh, is uh, the distribution of pro proposal parameters. So we're going to propose a new set of parameters uh, given our current set of parameters. And this makes, you know, allows us to make uh, propose a new set of parameters, which could be possible parameters for our model, given where we are at the moment. So as the simplest one of these, and, you know, it doesn't really work very well, but just as the simplest one, uh, a zero mean Gaussian perturbation about the current state. So what we do is we essentially sample proposals uh, by um, adding a Gaussian perturbation around uh, this, the, the, your current state. So this should be uh, times the identity, right? So, so that, you know, it matches the dimension of theta. But essentially, you can imagine like a little sphere, like a little Gaussian hump around my, my, my uh, point, and I, and I pull a random sample like that. Uh, so the proposal distribution Q is, uh, you know, psi given theta is also Gaussian. So something nice and easy, right? Um, and in this case, it's easy to see that this proposal distribution is symmetric. So if I flip theta and, and, and thi, then essentially these change, but it's a quadratic term, so has no effect, right? So in this simple case, the random walk is, is, is what we call a symmetric proposal distribution. And you'll see that has an influence later when you do Metropolis, right? Okay, I'm, I'm a picture person, so I'm going to talk about the algorithm in the pictures, and then we'll go back to the equation, right? So basically, this algorithm works by, um, by uh, starting at a random place in your parameter space. So this, this blue circle is meant to represent your parameter space. Um, and then you, you, you call the proposal distribution. So you've called your Gaussian, your random walk, for example, and that's made a proposal out here. You then accept that proposal with a certain probability. So if that um, proposal is more likely, then you always accept it. If it's less likely, then you accept it with this ratio, okay? And so you accept it with a particular ratio. And what you'll see here is for the symmetric uh, proposal, these two terms cancel. So it's essentially a ratio of, of the two um, target densities. So this will be the likelihood times by a prior, right? And um, essentially you just iteratively apply this process. So if you've never coded up Metropolis Hastings and you've got a spare five minutes, you know, to find your target distribution as sort of a, a Gaussian or something and, and try and sample from it. And it's, it's a good little exercise to do. And it's really simple. It should be a couple of lines of code, right? And, um, and so you make a proposal here, you accept, you might make a proposal out here, you reject, accept, reject, accept, reject, accept, accept, reject. Etc. So essentially, this is your Markov chain. So these are your samples. And whenever you reject, the sample gets repeated, right? And uh, you will sort of traverse this likelihood landscape. And ultimately, the distribution of these points uh, will, will be the distribution that you want, right? And so this allows you to get samples from this target distribution of the parameters given the data. Okay. So where does machine learning come in? Okay, this is gonna, machine learning is gonna come in in answering the big challenges of these, this algorithm, because it's, it's good. Like Metropolis is, is a nice algorithm because it's really simple, right? And, and as I said, try it yourself. Um, and, and, you know, it, it's kind of so simple that you think, okay, what's the deal here? Um, and um, yeah, the other good thing is like, you can make, you have to be careful about how you make a proposal distribution, but, under sort of relatively mild conditions, it's called must satisfy detail balance, right? But, um, and how you pick a start guess, then actually this will guarantee, you can prove mathematically, this will converge to exactly what you want. So it's kind of gold standard and robust, but it comes with significant challenges, right? In, and particularly in real world applications. So in synthetic problems where uh, your model, for example, so, when you evaluate this likelihood, so what's the probability of observing your data given your model? Well, when we calculated that, I'll go back. Um, to calculate that likelihood, we have to evaluate our model at a given parameter. Right? Uh, and so this is really quite expensive. 
Like it, it's, uh, you know, imagine it's a solve a Navier-Stokes equation right, over a, you know, over a sphere, on, you know, to do weather, for example. You're not going to be able to do lots and lots of these, right? So really computationally expensive. And then the another annoying thing is you don't always accept your new proposal. So like when you make an evaluation, you kind of, okay, you've, met, you've learned something about your model in your parameter space and you sort of say, well, it's not as good as it, it's not sufficiently as good as uh, the last one I was in my chain, I'm going to throw it away. So like hugely wasteful in, in the setting, right? The other thing about Markov chains is because they sort of evolve sequentially, so it's not like Monte Carlo where you can uh, pull random independent samples from your distribution uh, and so the, you can consider them as independent samples that you get out from your model. Here, because they're defined in a chain, they're correlated. So you might have n samples, but actually in effect, particularly in real world problems uh, with, with sort of difficult likelihoods, you'll find that the number of samples you have from this distribution is much, much smaller. So it's not untypical to say, on the example I'll show you, and if you just use vanilla methods, you might have 20,000 samples in your chain, but only of order 50 uh, effective samples, right? Just because of the correlation structure in the Markov chain. The other thing um, is it's difficult to parallelize. So just a bit like a time stepper, when you're solving an ordinary differential equation, it sort of, it's in time, it's sequential. So one links onto the other, et cetera. You have to think quite hard about strategies to parallelize it. So we're, you know, Monte Carlo or uh, when you're sort of just building emulators of models, uh, you, you can sort of uh, distribute them and you can do them in batches. So you can sort of solve them independently here because if, you know, if you do it sequentially, you have to wait for the result of the next thing. And you have to think quite hard about how you might parallelize it efficiently. So basically, I would say quite a bit of my research really tries to answer these questions um, and then um, and really use you know ideas from machine learning uh, or AI or, or you know just good old solid applied math uh, to try and address these problems. Um, today, I'm going to focus on one and two and show that you know how might you use a uh, um, how might you solve one and two? And then at the end, I'll talk about some current research um, or opportunities where ideas about how you might use machine learning or even sort of game theoretic reinforcement learning to, to, to sort of learn how you, how you can parallelize it. Um, so, I mean, it'd be easier if I was there because then I could I could ask you to ask yourself, but maybe... You know, given that you've just done a course on on machine learning uh, in the physical world, um, you know, think about how you might, you know, what method might you do to address one of these challenges? And probably the easiest one to think about is the top one that um, you might, uh, you know, yeah. So what do you do about the fact that this model is really expensive? And I don't know the course, but I know, I guess Neil Lawrence did some teaching on it and knowing his research, so one of the obvious things is to build an emulator, so uh, and a, a sort of machine learning approximation or a statistical approximation of, of this likelihood, and then you replace that as sort of as a surrogate uh, for, for your model, uh, allowing you to be able to do this machine, uh, this Metropolis Hastings process. There are other sort of approximations you can use. Uh, and I thought, because I had a student use neural networks i'm going to talk about how you use neural networks to accelerate it but um my go-to would be using a gaussian process to do that so how do you exploit a an approximate model um and and so um so you can imagine that you have this target distribution which is your absolute fine model so your full model which requires the solve that you want right and then you could think about denoting um a course, uh, my course model or approximate target distribution called pi c, so pi course, which is a basically proportional to something with an approximate likelihood in it, right? And there could be lots of strategies for doing this sort of uh, calculating this approximate likelihood, and I'll talk about a few of those in the next slide. But essentially, what a lot of people do is they, they essentially run Metropolis Hastings with this approximate likelihood. And that, I mean, that's, that's a reasonable thing to do. Uh, 
But one of the questions is, what does the influence of doing that have on you? So uh, particularly in safety critical systems, like I've now made this approximation of the likelihood, which is obviously fast, but it comes with uncertainty in it. And, and then if I then, I'm then not sampling from my target distribution, but I'm using Metropolis Hastings to sample from this approximate distribution. And then the question is, well, am I happy with that? Is, is it close enough for my decision? And that could be a really hard thing to say. So I'm more interested instead of just replacing uh, sampling, um, the key idea is to actually instead use the course distribution uh, as a to generate a proposal. So sorry, I've mixed notation here. I've called a proposal theta prime. But in the other thing, it was down here at psi. So I apologize for that. Uh, so can we use this course uh, approximate likelihood to generate proposals to our fine, right? And then is there a way that we can then accept or reject uh, those proposals that come from our course? So here's a schematic. We called this. Um, delayed acceptance uh, or multi-level delayed acceptance uh, in our work, but people also refer them as to surrogate transition methods. So in your chain, you have your current set of parameters on your, on your full model. You then duck down from that, you then run Metropolis Hastings for a little while um, with your approximate model. So if this was say a neural net approximation of your likelihood or a Gaussian process, you can sort of run it really, really fast. It would then, pop up a proposal, and then you have to think a bit hard about what the accept reject was, but essentially you can then write your uh, acceptance prob probability in a slightly different way. So always accept if it's better, and if it's worse, you, you essentially accept with this probability. And essentially the probability of the course distributions becomes the proposal distribution, right? And, and here, because the priors are the same on the course and the fine, they cancel. And obviously the normalization constants also cancel like before. So the idea is before, um, instead of making a proposal and straight away going to do an accept reject on the fine, we dive down, we run a sub chain and we pop up uh, on a course model, which is cheap to compute. We pop up a proposal and then we have a different accept reject. Now, the good thing about this is the approximation is obviously very cheap. And because this is a finite subchain, we can walk away from this point, right? And so this point and this point are more decorrelated, right? So we've got a decolorated proposal, uh, proposal uh, which um, rather than something which is, is strongly correlated, and we've got it cheaper. And providing essentially the course uh, approximation is a good approximation to the fine, then essentially this has a really high probability of being accepted. So this method essentially shifts um, the cost on the fine to the cost on the, the course, right? Um, relative to, the, to, to how they accept it. Is there, is there a question? Uh, that's just now, that's good. Uh, how expensive is the computation of the accept check propriety? Okay, re really, okay, so, um, it, yeah, so this is, this is where the cost is hidden, right? So if we, we go, um, essentially here you're calculating, so this one we've already calculated from the last step, we've already got these two in our pocket, right? And then essentially this one uh, is, is now the uh, target distribution of the proposal. So here we then have to calculate, um, the, the likelihood, so this involves a model solve of our fine, and, and, and then this is just to evaluation of our, our likelihood, right, so uh, of our prior, so it could be Gaussian, so this is really cheap, this requires a model solve, so this can be super expensive, so the key idea here is this one essentially only costs you the approximate, which might be just evaluating uh, you know, a set of neural network approximations, which I'll show you, or a, or a Gaussian, and but this one's the fine. But essentially, we're only very rarely doing fine solves. So most of the work in generating new independent proposals from this distribution is done by our course model. So this is the thing that offers you massive savings, right? Hopefully that makes sense, Max. Thanks for the question. Keep asking. I'll keep that up there. Thanks. 
Um, okay, so how can we make an approximation of the likelihood? And like, you can literally think of your favorite method and which method depends on the problem, right? So I'm not here to tell you, you should use GPs, you should use you know, neural nets. It really depends on what the problem is. And we'll just go through some of them. So a nice one is, um, because it also quantifies uncertainty, are Gaussian processes. Uh, so these are probabilistic regressors. Uh, so um, there's work by Rasmussen, so Noam at Cambridge, who's, who's looked at Gaussian, um, Gaussian process approximations of likelihoods. So these are, are probably one of the favorite, and they would be my go-to if I was doing this problem. Um, the challenge with the Gaussian process is they probably don't scale to very large inputs unless you're, you know, you work really hard, or, or, or I guess that's the one of the key open areas in 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 GPs. So, for example, if you if you've got a spatially random field in the examples that I look at, so of, of the permeability, um, you, you can imagine um, the number of parameters to describe that random field could be of of a thousand dimensions, uh, and so therefore Gaussian processes, you know, from a thousand dimensions to a likelihood are are not the best, right? Uh, or they struggle and and that means you have to be a bit smarter that, you know, probably all those dimensions aren't active. So you can use methods like active subspaces to, to find a smaller set of parameters in which to, to pose your problem. But uh, equally, autoencoders might help with that. But essentially, um, if it's very large dimensions, GPs might struggle and other methods might work. But if the, the parameter space is relatively small uh, or can be reduced to something small, then, then GPs are a good, good, good estimate. Um, some nice work by uh, Yusef Mazuka MIT just shows that um, even k-means approximations. So you make a uh, um, random evaluations of your model. So you you have a distribution that you suddenly choose to uh, um, uh, com uh, compute your fine model, and then you can approximate what the likelihood is by sort of just fitting a, a little polynomial through the points that you've got, or doing k-means. So sort of a local clustering. Um, approximation on the fly, uh, which you can sort of adapt by periodically solving um, more and more fine to sort of explore the space. Um, neural nets, obvious one that you can sort of go from from fairly large dimensional inputs to to your likelihood uh, requires a lot of training data, so negative against the GP. Or, I mean, my I'm a mathematician by background, so often I use not only things like GP uh, emulators, but also use mathematical approximation. So I can change the grid resolution of my model often or the time resolution, but also I can do a, like a model order reduction. Uh, so um, so the various techniques for reducing the size of your problem and making coarse models so from a math side. So any combination of these are, are possible and you can actually do more than one stitch together as well, but we won't talk about that here. When does this approach? Just check this, um, when does this approach uh, struggle? Um, well, you can imagine that if you have a bad course model, um, you can imagine you're trying to estimate sample from a density which is blue, right? And and if your course model is bad, um, you can ascent, you, you sort of you're sampling from something that's offset, right? And it's easy to see that okay, I'm walking around this course model. Um, and I, I will, I'll sort of walk over here because I'll be accepted over here by the fine. But when I then try and generate another proposal, it's going to sort of try and walk itself back this way, right? And instead, to get over here and traverse the whole of this um, distribution landscape, I'm really in the tails of the course distribution. So these, so without being doing something more these models really struggle when there are big discrepancies between your course and your fine model. So you need good approximations. Or do you, right? Does this really matter? So a really interesting thing, um, and this and sort of underpin that sometimes simple is good, right? So every time you do an accept reject, so every time you uh, make a proposal here, you you have to evaluate the model, your forward model F, on the course for, for your parameter, your proposal, and on the fine. So every time you do that, you get a feedback of the difference between your forward model for your fine and your course, right? 
And so when we write our statistical model down, so I did a math degree, and the first thing you learn is, is if in doubt, add and subtract the same thing, right? So this is the standard thing to do. So we adding the course model and subtracting it. So I've done nothing to the equation for this forward model, but essentially now I can see this as, here's the data is equal to my forward model plus a corrector term, a bias from my, 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 my course model plus an error, right? And I think you did multi-fidelity Gaussian processes. So this might look a bit like a multi-fidelity Gaussian process and it, and it does, right? Um, here, we're gonna do something really simple we're going to approximate this, um, this bias by a multivariant distribution, right? So every time we sample, we're going to get a sample for this chat, right? And we'll be able to update, so I'll put it down here, we'll essentially sequentially be able to update what the mean is of this corrector and a covariance, right? So simple shift, right? We could do something more complicated. You could actually build a GP for this corrector, but it doesn't actually help, Like right? This simple dirty method really works. So what does this do? It allows you in your course model to change the likelihood you write. So what you have is you have an, a shift term in your data. So I say, okay, I evaluate my course and then I shift by the mean corrector. Um, that's the same on this side. And then I have this additional uh, uncertainty covariance term, which is associated with, with, with the learn term here. So geometrically, what does this do? Looking back to our example, the shift essentially aligns the center of mass of the blue distribution on the red. And then essentially the covariance rotates and stretches it. So I cover it. And so you can even have really offset models, which aren't that good, and actually uh, correct them on the fly um, by, by this simple trick. And this works really effectively. So essentially on the fly, we're learning how to correct our machine learning course approximation, right? And so it gets better and better and better the more we sample. Um, I know like a lot of my students, they like playing around with code, particularly code that's pip install. So um, a big part of what we've done is we've implemented these methods in PyMC3, uh, which is a really well-known probabilistic uh, programming uh, language. So these are under something called uh, multi-level delayed acceptance. So what I'm talking about are two levels, but I'll talk later and you can actually generalize this over hierarchy. Uh, or my PhD student, Mikhail, has written a really uh, nice lightweight code called TinyDA. And you can just sort of instantly set up and play around with these problems. Uh, um, and so I'm gonna talk about one of his problems quickly and then try and get on some questions. So we'll sort of, fly through this because it's just a really a demonstration of, of how this works. So I won't go into too much details, but the groundwater equations, uh, the classic model for this is Darcy. Uh, so this is a basically a, a balance equation. Uh, so this is a pumping or a sink or source term. Uh, U is the, the, the pressure head. So gra uh, K is the uh, conductivity. So uh, K of grad U, this term is the flux. So sort of the average flux around, this is a sort of balance must, must much in, so the flow in and out of an element must sort of match with what you're doing, whether you're pumping it in or out, okay? Uh, and then on the boundaries, you will have the Riesle boundaries and Neumann boundary conditions. So this specifies the head, this specifies uh, the flow. Um, so uh, I'll tell you what it is. So, yeah, permeability is gonna be a random field. So a really complicated distribution of, of, of what the rock permeability. So here we're looking at the log of K. So it changes over, so it varies by scale a lot and over short length scales. So I'll tell you a bit about this in the slide. Um, so if you solve this using the finite element method, which I'm sure you've done, um, you then uh, have a system of linear equations parameterized where the stiffness matrix is parameterized on theta. So theta is gonna be our parameterization in this random field. And then our forward model is essentially P, here is a projection. So I, I solve for you. So this is just the solution. And then I project by evaluating what the pressure is at certain points. So in this example, we've got locations where we have pressure measurements. Uh, we have a Dirichlet boundary condition of one and zero at this edge. 
and we actually are uh, extracting fluid at this point, so we're sucking it out, right? So this is the solution for the for the underlying field. Right? I won't go too much into this because it's about random fields, but essentially you can generate random fields like this, uh, families of random fields by a covariance function, and then finding the eigenvalues of covariance function. And then all this says is I can generate random fields uh, by this parameter theta. So right, I have, I now have a vector of numbers, which I put the priors as, as uh, zero Gaussians, uh, standard Gaussians, uh, independent. And then this generates um, random fields with a mean conductivity, log mean conductivity, and a covariance structure uh, which is um, defined by this matern in my case, but it could be any covariant structure, right? This just gives you a way to parameterize it. So for the test examples, what we do is we, we actually define a different uh, covariance to, to make it kind of a bit more challenging. We sample a random theta. We then forget that we knew that. We solve that problem. That gives us synthetic data. And then we, then we put a prior on our theta, and that allows us to generate. So the name of the game is we want to find the distribution of theta, uh, the vector of theta, which recovers the permeability field for our rock, right? Uh, and typically, in, in the case that we're going to look at, the dimension of this is 200, right? so it's quite large. So these are some examples. You can sort of play around with the length scale of the covariance and also the number of uh, parameters, and you can sort of see the menagerie of Gaussian random fields you can generate. Mm. These are widely used in geostatistics, right? So just simply, and I won't get into too much details. Um, I think most of you know what a neural network is. Uh, so essentially we can build a neural network for our course model. So we essentially have a whole set of inputs. So this was the 200 inputs. Um, and then the outputs will be the, the measurements of the flux. So it's H for head, but it should be U. This is essentially the prediction of our data, right? And then we can uh, look at different various different architectures for this deep neural network. Uh, and we can, can sample a whole load of training runs. And we obviously just define our loss between, we want to minimize the, the discrepancy or the, the mismatch between our, our, our model and our course, our, our true model of a full solve and our approximate. So we're essentially making a surrogate for, for this course model, right? So, just to say what you get out, this is typically what you get out. So I've done the first six parameters here. So these are typically the distributions you get. Um, so these are the samples you get from output of uh, Metropolis Hastings. Uh, and you'll see uh, they, they have particular distributions, which are you know, sometimes nice, sometimes nasty. Uh, and so these are zero means. So you obviously see that the, the posterior is doing something. But there's zero mean prior. So obviously, like here's an example where it is actually picking up that you theta three is should be this value, right? So this is the typical output that we get. We don't get a single answer for what theta should be, but we get distributions of answers for what theta could possibly be given the data. Going fast now because I'd like a bit of time to, to, to ask some uh, random questions. Um, so just to give you an idea of the saving that you can achieve. Um, so typically in this simple example, you get a factor 10 saving, which isn't massive, right? But it is actually not a very expensive problem. Um, it also, the most significant cost for the um, delayed, uh, delayed acceptance and using this approximation is actually the training samples for building the neural network itself. And actually in this case, if, if, if it wasn't too high dimensional, a Gaussian process would do a lot, lot better, right? Um, but it's just, so yeah, here the, the cost is significant for training it. Um, and so these are different, these are training a, a particular neural network architecture. And the, the 4,000 is the number of samples used to train it. The EEM is the um, expected error model or adaptive error model. So this is with or without the, the error model. And we can see that essentially you get to a, I mean, the model that you would probably select out of this is, is the, the neural network approximation train with 16,000 samples uh, with the expected error model. So that helps. Um, so I don't know 
you know, if you've done MCMC, you, you, you kind of get very used to looking at pictures that look like this, right? And this is the influence of the method. And, and you know, in the simple case, we said that the saving 10 times is okay. And, and most of the training is, is used in, in, in training your, your machine learning approximation. But to, to sort of stats people interested in MCMC, this is the, this is the clincher, right? Um, so on the left, what you see are traces of a parameter, one of the parameters, if you just use vanilla MCMC, this is with a not random walk with something called PCN. So a slightly more sophisticated proposal distribution. But you can see these are really correlated. There's clear structure in here, right? And so the autocorrelation lengths of these are in, often in the thousands, right? Um, whereas for the deep, so using our delayed acceptance with this sort of deep neural network proxy and this adaptively learned error model, we call these in our group hairy caterpillars or fractal worms. You can see that they're really, the autocorrelation length of these signals are really, really short. And that's what you want. You're generating lots of good independent samples. And, and this is really the clincher that we now have used machine learning to calibrate a model. And, and we've now developed a robust um, uh, yeah, uh, proposal strategy for, for sampling. In the real world, in, in sort of really more complicated examples, this is really the difference between either being able to do it or not do it, right? And so this is, you know, in, in the real world, you see much worse things than this if you try vanilla MCMC, you just see sort of flat signals, right? And so this is this is the game changer in this space, right? Um, okay, so including marks and, 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 and a few minutes for questions. Um, so approximations uh, from machine learning really can make big speed ups to model calibration. And it's, um, it's an exciting area, a really active area of research, but in the dawn of things, or dawn or active, of digital twins or the use of models, that these kind of acceleration techniques have never been so important, right? Um, the, a lot of the gains just comes from this really simple idea of, of this simple adaptive error model, that you can have a fairly coarse model, a surrogate, and which is, is okay, maybe captures some of the features. Um, um, and, and then you can adaptively correct it on the fly, um, actually sees, sees the gain. Um, in our work, we actually generalize this over multiple levels. So what I've shown you is just two levels, but you can imagine stacking multiple approximations. So they could actually be in a hierarchy or they can actually be in a graph. So you can actually do more funky things that you can imagine having an ensemble of approximation models, some doing well in some regimes, than others, so lots of opportunities to, to do that. Um, it's not my area, but so I'm, I'm normally interested in the calibration of physics-based models, so ODEs, PDEs, um, but there's a group at Turing that have sort of taken it as a challenge of how do they use these methods to maybe use them to train more traditional machine learning problems, so like Bayesian neural nets. I mean, typically you would, you would use something that's approximate, uh, so uh, like variational methods to do Bayesian neural networks on, uh, but they're sort of saying, well, actually, can you build hierarchies of um, neural networks? Uh, can you build hierarchies in the data? So there's different types of hierarchies you can use in parameters and, and data. Um, my gut feeling is that once you've got a lot of data, then the approximate methods are okay. So um, if anyone's interested, there's a paper at the bottom um, in Europe, which um, is about this. We don't have time to talk about parallelization, but there's an interesting question, like, can you hedge or bet? Like, um, and can you take a game theoretic approach? So you could always bet ahead and say, oh, I'm going to accept this one, so I'm going to pre-compute it. Or at the lower levels, you're, you're likely to, to reject, right? And uh, so then do you want to spawn off multiples? And that would be sort of hedging or betting. And so we're currently studying, you know, um, sort of game theoretic ways to parallelize MCMC, even though it's sequential. And I hope Ivor doesn't mind, but at Turing and Exeter, we have PhDs in this area. And as your master students, some of you might be interested, but they're all different titles, but they're all in the same area. So how can we accelerate UQ using deep learning? And uh, if you're interested or have any questions, like just send me an email. I like emails. So. Cool.